Welcome back to a, another episode of Thinking Critically. Today is going to be a, another panel podcast where we have the entire IS team. And we're going to be talking about the recent Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma. And for those of you that haven't seen it, it is, like it sounds, about social networks. And in particular, so like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, all of these social networking platforms, and essentially how they have deleterious effects on society. And they didn't initially start out this way. They wanted to connect people, but due to the nature of the business model and the marketplace capitalism driving it to maximal profits, that it has turned into this kind of chimera, this monster that drives people apart, it keeps them in their bubbles, and just overall, it's not healthy for a democratic society or, I mean, society in general. So anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. It's super interesting, and there is a lot to dig through. Anyway, gentlemen, so Social Dilemma, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you um, summarized and encapsulated a lot of the message uh, pretty well in your synopsis. So thank you for pro providing that. Uh, I think it's interesting, you know, me working in the psychedelic industry, I see a lot of parallels, you know, in that social media and psychedelic drugs are both very powerful tools, but I, I believe that they're um, more or less amoral. You know, it's the way that they're used which I think is going to be a, maybe a lot of what our discussion centers around today, um, because we have seen these technologies have extraordinarily beneficial qualities and bring people together and catalyze social movements and revolutions and change across the world. But at the same time, we've also seen the effects that it's having, especially on young minds. And I think that should be a big focus of our conversation is the suicide rate increasing and how this can kind of like amplify neuroses and stuff that the younger people have um and and it's surely having really harmful effects uh, on them you know so I, I see an interesting parallel there and i think it comes down to the, the conscious use of this technology not necessarily labeling the technology itself as bad or good uh, but that's just my two cents uh, out the gate here so you say that you say that there's some an element of amorality to the to the technology which i'm certainly not disputing but who has the onus to use the technology properly? So is it the big tech companies that are, that are using the technology improperly, gathering all of these data, and then ultimately delivering us product after product after product after product and reinforcing all of these ideas that we may not have even know we, known we had, um, and basically just proceeding to, to use the technology not to benefit us necessarily because we're not their customers advertisers are their customers so is it on is it on companies to use the technology properly or is it on us as is consumers to to use the technology properly I, th I think we should define what proper and improper is and we should uh, highlight what it, for the people that haven't watched the documentary what exactly it is about these technologies that is um, being labeled as insidious because on the surface it's just like well I'm just on Facebook but when we watch the social dilemma you find out really what's going into those notifications uh, the slot machine like uh, interface you know where you're trying to get that you know it, trying to get that uh, social approval from people you know um, and how that makes you feel uh, and especially how that's geared towards a younger generation so in kind of answering your question I think it kind of depends to some degree on the age limit. I, I do think for younger minds and maybe for people under 16 or 18, like there needs to be a different interface and there needs to be protections um, because like this type of technology really seems to prey on them a lot more than the, than, you know, people that are older. And so it has an interesting element of, do we regulate it like cigarettes and alcohol, you know, and if so, how? You know, and I think that's an interesting topic that comes up. Yeah, I ideally, that, ideally, I would think that the onus would fall on the producer, right, to do, to have, you know, some sort of integrity, morals, values, et cetera. But again, you know, as I had mentioned in the introduction, when you then introduce a product into the marketplace, you become publicly traded. Therefore, it's profits above everything else. So at some point, 
the, that particular type of motivation is going to drive you in a direction that, that we're now seeing where you are creating technologies that are like hyper addictive and you know you're talking about age limits which you know i actually don't think that that's necessarily a, a bad idea actually that might be a very good idea some sort of warning or something of that nature you know just how you know you were talking about the the slot the slot machine analogy you know casinos there are gambling hotlines things of that nature i don't think that there's any sort of uh like any sort of smoke and mirror when it comes to, hey, that these are built for addiction. Uh, I think right. people are very much aware of that. You know, whereas with social media, your smart devices, things of that nature, I don't think that that's common knowledge. At least it's, it hasn't been common knowledge up until this point. Yeah. And they've been around, it's been around for what, 15 years now? So. No, you, you bring up a really good point. I think maybe it's, it's a jump in real quick. If someone could explain a little bit what it is about these technologies that it's been highlighted in the social dilemma that makes them so addicting. I still feel like maybe the viewer that's listening to this that hasn't seen the movie uh, might still think that they're just innocently browsing Facebook and not understanding how they're the actual um, product that's being sold, you know, like it talks yeah. about in the documentary. So if someone wants to maybe pad or someone wants to explain that a little more, that would be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can do that. So all of us have these online profiles with whatever social media source we're using, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or even things like, like YouTube. So every time you interact with a certain type of information, whether it be an individual's picture or you're liking, you know, a website on like rock climbing or something along those lines, um, all of the engagement that you have with social media is aggregated into these huge, huge miles long uh, rooms of servers by, by these big tech giants. And how they use that information is they build these algorithms that, that aggregate all of your data together and basically build a so, so psychological profile of you. And in doing so, they know how to target you with specific ads, specific videos, specific articles that are things that you're predisposed to, to already like. So that's why, you know, you could look at my newsfeed and it's going to be completely, you know, different from anybody else's newsfeed because it's been specifically tailored uh, for me, which brings up a whole ton of issues um, and sort of separating like the the adults from from the children and in this in this regard yeah kids I feel like are kids definitely experience some sort of detrimental effects anxiety depression because everything is sort of wrapped up in a cycle of needing of needing you know approval over and over and over again your life is reduced to the amount of likes that you get on a photo and not getting those likes, you know, can lead to anxiety and depression and um, interacting with people. We're not evolutionarily built to interact with tens of thousands of people and try and tailor every, like every point of our personality to what those people perceive of us. I'm really then, glad you brought that up. Yeah, you can yeah, finish your point. I was just going to say, and then with adults, for example, a, these social media giants are basically just constructing these echo chambers for, for these adults. So if, if you, you know, if you go online and like you're a, if you're like a huge fringe group, like let's say you're a white supremacist, you're like one of the people in Charlottesville or whatever, you're able to go on Facebook and you're able, able to find like-minded people who believe the same things you do. And then these algorithms get built out by your engagement with that group. And all of a sudden your newsfeed is filled with misleading or fake news that makes you believe that other people are sharing your opinions and you see it on your newsfeed. So you assume everybody else must see it. So all of a sudden you've got all these sources that are just confirming your natural biases, your cognitive biases. And that leads to this, sort of division I think that we're seeing in politics and in society today. It's just everybody 
believe so strongly in certain things and it drives us apart as opposed to pull us together. So I think that there's elements and, you know, all different age groups. And I think it's a, you know, multifaceted issue and approach that, uh, that these social media giants are, uh, are taking. Yeah. You brought up a really good point, which, which makes me draw an interesting parallel to the book Sapiens, you know, for those of you who've read it, talking about how, we've evolved too quickly in some ways, you know, in ways that our emotional and our psychological and also physiological systems have not been able to catch up to the rate at which technology has allowed us to do certain things like connect with not just the immediate people around us. You know, when we're, we have built, we have been built and evolved a certain capacity to, you know, regulate or, or need approval from maybe a handful of people in our tribe or society. Now that's shifted to the whole globe very rapidly, you know. Uh, and so in, in the book Sapiens, they talk a lot about that, you know, how we've uh, the same kind of techniques or maybe strategies that have allowed us to become the dominant species uh, are also some of the, our biggest pitfalls, you know, uh, because we're not quite ready for how quickly technology has allowed us to, to expand in, in this way. Um, Gary, what are some of your thoughts, man? You're always a thoughtful one that <laughs> I'm always curious what <laughs> well, you're thinking, you know? <laughs> After watching it, I am uh, more confident that there is no free will. Um, mm, but, wow. uh, Interesting. Um, yeah, I think that, um, oh, I lost my train of thought here. Um, Sorry, I put you on the spot. There was, <laughs> One of the things I was going to say was, I think that this is part of a deeper problem with sort of the economy as a whole and the capitalist mindset. Um, so the, the Frankfurt School of Philosophy um, had this critique of what they call monopoly capitalism, where it's designed, the, the system of capitalism, once it gets to this point, is designed in such a way where you go to work where you become depressed because you work and cap and then advertising sells you this idea that you get your money you spend your money to get happier so you go to work you get depressed you get off work you spend money so you can buy things to make you happy so that you can go back to work and get depressed again and then you come back and buy things and i think that this whole system of the advertising model of social media works on essentially the same thing where if they can control your emotions, they can push you toward buying things essentially to, you know, make you feel better or going down these rabbit holes of information um, in your clusters that they push you into. So like part of the movie was explaining how, um, like your political affiliation and the things you post regarding that, they will target you for advertisements and um, articles that essentially confirm your biases and keep you within a certain sphere. Um, but all, all of this is to sell you stuff. Like, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's because they want to, they want to get you in a state where you're more likely right. to buy things. I think and that was ultimately. The, yeah, I think yeah. it's not even necessarily that Facebook wants to sell you stuff. It's the people paying Facebook want you right. to buy stuff, and so yeah. But that's their motive. I mean, if the people right, that yeah. are paying, so, yeah. paying Facebook to sell things through ads, then that by is what proxy. Facebook. Yeah, by proxy, that is Facebook's goal is right. to put you in a position where they essentially manipulate you so that you're in a psychological state which is more prone to buying stuff. That, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like it's just like, oh, you know, I'm going on social media to hang out with my or to check out what my friends are up to. And because this platform is free, there's going to be ads. Yeah. That makes sense. And that's the really innocuous surface level that that they've all got us to think, you know, and now we realize that that's that's not the case, you know, and like the, the people in this documentary, these are the, they were some of the leading developers, Facebook, Google, you know, Instagram, like if anyone knows, you know, it's, it's these people and they talk about how they don't let their kids use social media, like at all, you know, and that's, that's saying something, you know, if you're like Mark Zuckerberg and you don't let your kid use Facebook, like why? <laughs> it makes you, yeah. it makes you kind of ask yourself that a lot of kids all over the world are using it, you know, and, and for me, it was really, 
uh, it was, I kind of hit home a little bit for me when I saw that girl, like, post something, a like, little girl, you know, a little black girl towards the end, and she, like, was waiting for, like, likes or something, and she didn't get any, and then she deleted it, and you saw her start crying, and, like, in some yeah. human way, like, we all understand that. We understand what she was looking for. We understand the pain that she feels, and it's, like, now it's not just, like, oh, I go and maybe that happens in a real life interaction, you know? Like now that sort of rejection and needing uh, approval, it's a constant thing. And it's that, it's that fact that you can pull out of your pocket and you can get it right away. And it's really, you know, as someone that knows and has studied a lot about addiction and recovery and, and how drugs work in the brain, it's remarkable how similar this technology uh, causes that dopamine hit, you know? And, and, and for that reason, I think there needs to be for sure some sort of age limit or restriction on it, you know, because like we're building, we're just like grooming a future technology, drugs, sex, gambling, all sorts of addicts, you know, and like, that's a scary thought. Well, no, oh, yeah, yeah, precisely, right? I mean, it is an addictive substance, essentially. And yeah. we have certain regulations and how we treat addictive substances elsewhere in society. We now have this techno technological platform that is documented an addictive substance, yet there's no sort of regulation or anything like that. And it's clearly having deleterious effects on society. Well, and, the, you know, go ahead, Pat. I was just going to say, well, the thing is, like, uh, yes, I am 100% on board with you guys. And you've even seen, like, if you're just talking about the, yes, you guys are addictive substances and, you know, all those sorts of things we have regulations against. But we even have regulations against things that are seemingly more innocuous, like the way in which advertisers can put ads on television or before movies or something along those lines like it you know we had regulations that said you couldn't have joe camel you know smoking cigarettes uh, uh, during saturday morning cartoons and whatnot because they you can predispose kids to, to smoking but the thing is like all of these previous technological advances didn't happen with the exponential sort of growth that we've seen with these new technological advances. Like you're seeing just exponential growth over exponential growth over exponential growth. Um, I think that we've, we've, we've increased our computing power by 100 quadrillion times, like over the last, <laughs> like uh, however many years it was in, in the documentary. How many but, zeros uh, is that? <laughs> So many zeros. Yeah. <laughs> so many zeros. Uh, so many. But the, the, so c compare that to the fact that our democracy by its very nature works slow because we're a, we're a con more of a consensus body, even though we've become, you know, more divisive in recent years, but you need to get X amount of votes in the house. You need to get X amount of votes in the Senate. And then the president needs to sign things into law. So until there is like a collective will or, you know, collective sort of outcry for these politicians to actually do something, there's, there's no onus for, for them, for them to do something, nor would they even have the ability because they don't have the votes. You just have to have a lot of consistency across the body. So until we become more willing to adapt more quickly, I just don't see any regulation coming down the pipe. So it's basically like the wild, wild west in the tech world, right? I mean, yeah. If you're talking about like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, these things really exploded on the scene in like 2010, 2011, around there. And since then, there has been no substantial legislation to limit the ads that they can sell to people, how they're using their data, and, um, and no limitations on the veracity of the things that they're selling you. They can sell you lies, basically. So I mean, it took, no it took swinging elections and, and, and not just in the United States. This, should, this happens all over the world, over you know, the world. for people to finally be like, well, maybe we should look at this, you know? Uh, because you're right, the, the, the framework in place for implementing policy changes is way too slow to keep too up slow. with how fast this is moving. And they're becoming way too big and way too powerful and and we realize you know the the impact that's going to have it's not like just a neutral governing body it's not influenced by these huge tech giants you know uh mm -hmm. so this all plays all plays into it you know? yeah the government has always represented people 
with special interests because those are the people that are funding campaigns, they're keeping them in power. And that's just a dynamic that we have seemed to come to accept like even more so in recent years with rulings like Citizens United where you're basically allowed to, um, a, a corporation is basically allowed to donate unlimited funds to candidates. And these are the biggest companies in the world with millions and mil no, billions and billions of dollars to burn they can certainly be funding campaigns They can be buying votes on Capitol Hill and it can stay, you know, the wild, wild west for an indefinite amount of time. And I think the only thing that can change that is if there's a collective uprising within the population that's saying that this is not this is not acceptable. But that being said, the population, I feel like a lot of them don't know that it's actually a problem. One, the population really and, likes Facebook and their Instagram too. And, and I was <laughs> going to say, media, yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say too, are not predisposed to change anything because from their perspective, uh, they've built these echo chambers for themselves and all of right. our social media based on who we follow, based on what we interact with. So most people don't perceive that as a problem because they still think they're getting quote unquote news they feel like they're watching videos that entertain them so it's like what's the motivation what's the onus at that point to be like we need to upset the status quo and i just i just don't think that the motivation's there or, or the awareness it, it, to even get to get to that point is uh talk, talk, talk about an opiate for the masses huh like, yeah. yeah right <laughs> and you know something uh something that they mentioned in the documentary so there's this one primary character who um is like the founder of like something for responsible uh people for like responsible technology or something of that nature and he was originally working so he's definitely a silicon valley guy i don't know if he was working with one of these companies he has experience or what exactly his background is but i can't remember but anyway the documentary kind of focuses around him and one of the things that he talks about is that how do you actually convince society that this is something that they need to be concerned about because of all the points that you brought up, Pat. And he said that the key is to focus on how this technology highlights the worst of humanity, essentially, um, and how it brings out the worst in us. And that it's not necessarily the, the good aspects, you know, the connections, things of that nature. You may love watching kitten videos and hitting, hitting those like buttons and connecting with friends and staying in touch with people that you haven't talked to in years but that this technology actually does bring the worst out of us, that it highlights these things. Uh, it puts us into those bubbles, it drives division. And that through this division and uh, these other types of like nef nefarious types of side effects or uh, if you will, uh, th that it's these things that need to be highlighted. And I mean, I definitely can see that, you know, particularly since 2016, you know, you're talking about, you know, people are saying like, we've never been this divided before. And I don't think it's just social media. Uh, I think that there are other things that are driving that uh, from like a leadership standpoint. But when you talk about what led up to this point, I think that social media bears some of that burden, um, the, driving, the driving people apart. And you know, one of the striking features of this particular documentary is that you have one of the individuals that they, they have up that they interviewed. Um, I don't know if he's like currently like the CEO of Pinterest or what his position at Pinterest is, but he worked, I believe, with Facebook. But anyway, they ask him the question point blank, what are you most concerned about that like the negative consequences of all of this? And he's like, again, point blank, like super serious. In the immediate future, civil war. That's what he said, civil war, wow. that these technologies are driving people apart at such an alarming rate and it's continuing that he is concerned about civil war. Yeah, so, like, they, they just started with, you know, like fact checking on Facebook and Twitter and all that after essentially all the congressional hearings where yeah. they were like, I know Facebook for a while did not want to do any sort of fact checking because they wanted it to be like a free market of information where you could just post whatever lies you wanted and if people like bought it then that was their own problem but now that they started doing that it's almost like you're asking them to in a way like cut off their own head because 
that what the platform is essentially designed to do is to feed you the the biases you already have and just reinforce your your opinions um, and not really present facts or they present like a kettle logic of little snippets of facts that are so far apart and don't have enough to link them together that you you don't get the full picture and so a distorted worldview yeah (laughs) right so like they said in the video you know everybody is coming at each other with their own facts and it's like i partially agree with that because yeah you have little snippets of facts but then like you're missing out on on the context and uh so yeah, like the whole adding this fact checking thing is almost just like I don't I don't know. I, it just seems like you're you're asking the platforms to, you know, sever their own power in a way. Um and I feel like there's there's got to be a better way that they could be doing it because I think they just have like people that go around and, you know, you highlight, you say this is this is fake and then some person has to go and look at it and then say yes and then they can send out this thing that marks it on all of the platforms but if the ai is so advanced you would think that they could write programs that would sort of pick out like flag snippets of information and articles that are just like completely made up and then do it for you but i feel like they they would never do that because they still want the people on the platforms to have access to the incorrect information, even if they're putting flags on it that say it's it's bad information. So long as the institutions self-govern, that is always going to be a problem. But um, yeah, uh, to the cutting off your foot like comments, uh, Garrett, I mean, companies have to do things that aren't in their best interest all of the time in order to provide consumer protections to us. Like there's limits on how much carbon you could emit because it's bad for the environment. There's, um, there's limits on who, what age a person has, they have to be a minimum age for you to, to hire them. So we've got child labor laws. So like, there's a lot of laws that, you know, are sort of like anti-corporation or whatever, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't be putting those laws into place. Yeah, but but we're asking them to do it voluntarily, essentially. Exactly, which we can't do. There's got to be some sort of force for that. But to to John's like point, like, uh, I'm not trying to be an alarmist or trying to be like somebody who's like, uh, you know, it's the end of the world, like da, 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 da. But, you know, civil war doesn't seem like something that's like that out of the question, which is absolutely insane to say. But, I mean, if you look at, you know, World War II and how, you know, the Nazis built up their their party, they did it through propaganda and misinformation. Oh, yeah. And they, and they you know, basically sold themselves as the solution to the problems that they had fabricated in some cases or exacerbated or, you know, just... Um, put out of proportion um, uh, it, within the party and then sold themselves as, you know, the biggest solution. But they did that through like newspapers and pamphlets. It's like the right wing and fascist governments of the world and including here in the United States are doing that at lightning speed. They've taken the process and turned it into the the ability to, to spread propaganda at the click of a mouse. Sometimes not even that because it's just automatically done for you once it's put in an algorithm. So it's become so much more infinitely easy to spread that propaganda and that misinformation. And, and there, there was another line in the, in the documentary that was just like, I wrote it down, I highlighted it, I starred it. And um, this one of the gentlemen who was on there was just like, imagine if you opened up Wikipedia, which is sort of a yeah. standard source, the same, the same for everybody. We're all getting the same information. We're all getting the same facts. We're all getting the same sources. But imagine if we opened up Wikipedia and it was like our Facebook news feeds where it was populated with the facts that we wanted to hear about whatever topic it was that we were looking at. Yeah, and she looked up shoe and it was like a different definition of a shoe for, yeah, everybody. for each person. Yeah, but we all course, think we're seeing person. the same definition because that's yeah. what we all thought Facebook and everything was from the beginning. And, and that's yeah. a really good point. 
and that's and that's the situation now is we all think that we have the same information and this is this is not a republican problem this is not a democratic problem this is a problem for everybody where we look at the information we have and we're like wow how could these morons on the other side think anything differently based on all of this information because we're assuming that they've got access to the same sources as we do but they don't so all of us are just like in this never ending cycle of thinking not thinking that you know we're we're close together but thinking that we're very very far apart on all of our issues and social media just goes and you know ramps that up and now it's become even it's unnecessary to even engage with people who have different opinions with us it's it's unnecessary to even talk about our views because they've just been sold to us on a facebook uh, on a Facebook um, news feed. So it, it's removed all of that sort of elegance of having a discussion and bringing up different points and coming to conclusions together. And everybody just comes in already knowing, you know, what their quote unquote, you know, beliefs are and quote unquote, what the facts are. And it's yeah. super discouraging. You know, another, another thing that's alarming, Pat, you know, you're talking about how things spread at lightning speed is that one of the one of the things that they highlighted in the documentary is that like fake news and like the more outlandish like conspiracy theories like that stuff spreads quicker than normal news six times faster on twitter yes. right it was it yeah six times or yeah. seven times somewhere around there it spreads faster than regular news so more effort needs to be put into actually like debunking it and you know trying to stop the spread of something that is moving that quickly like i don't even i don't even know how you would do that from a uh, you know from a contingency standpoint or when you're trying to rectify the situation like it's like really really hard to then say okay like how do i then you know how do i do damage control uh which is why i think some of the you know th some of the things that we talk about through intelligence speculation is you know if you think if you think about if you think about these spreads as like disease i think pat you'll enjoy this analogy but if you think of it as like diseased information that's spreading throughout the <clears throat> internet community throughout society i mean it's through it's all virtual um there is no sort of actual like microscopic pathogen but it's all virtual but spreading if you think of it as a disease then you can think of you know perhaps the like the critical thinking and like the science education types of skills that we talk about regularly as like an inoculation so as a vaccine that will help to spread, uh, that will help to um, impede the spread of information of this nature. Uh, but I, I just, I just think it's really, really alarming the statistic that you know fake stuff spreads way quicker than the real thing. It's just, it's just crazy. <laughs> and misinformation is like an infection so the analogy holds up and people do get infected with those ideas and once they do it's very difficult to get them to have a different perspective so unless you've got sources like intelligence speculation or you know people out there who are actually doing more research and like uh, you have government laws that are put into place and Facebook fact checkers and all those things like do serve to like impede the spread. But at this point, we haven't reached that critical mass where we can stop that idea from propagating through large portions of the population. So we need to do more. We need to have more of those sort of um, inoculative effects. Like we need, um, we need yeah. nerd immunity. <laughs> ah, that was awesome. Yeah. Nerd immunity. I've never heard that, that before. Yeah, that's not that's not mine. Uh, that's not mine. I don't take ownership for it. But I think that there was like some sort of tweet a couple months ago talking about the very idea. I mean, because I've talked about this concept for years. I know through the platform is the idea that you know you can look at this as like diseased information. And what we need is an inoculation. But then this person, right. you know, herd immunity a play a play off that came up with nerd immunity and I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. That's so yeah, what brilliant. we need is nerd immunity. <laughs> we need yeah. that critical mass. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's just also important to, to think that, to know that you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to, 
you know, you don't even have to have like a college degree, you know, like to, to do your own sort of assessment on whether or not a source is good or a source is misleading you. And I think that like that's, that like that's a point that you know we need to to be able to make and to distinguish is like you don't have to like there's no like elitism in in information or in the understanding of information it it's something that everybody can do you know with a with a little bit of practice and a little bit of extra effort so i i just think that yeah we you know we just i guess need to need to to be clear about that uh, as well too so i think it's taken, taken us so long to uh, figure out what the problem was with these platforms um and and it wasn't so simple for us to kind of uncover that you know and, and realize what's going on um even more challenging it seems especially based on our conversation is how are we going to fix it you know there's no uh there's no easy solution here it's not like one rule or one piece of legislation or you know uh, it, it's going to require a multifaceted multi-dimensional multi-pronged approach you know from a governing a combination of governing bodies and the platforms themselves but most importantly uh like like john just talked about it's going to fall on us you know it's going to fall on the people to apply those critical thinking skills uh, to to the information and I know it's going to be hard when we're in these echo chambers and we're kind of designed to want to be agreed with or we want people to agree with us and agree with our points of view and I saw a really cool quote yesterday I think it was a Terrence McKenna quote uh, you're only as young as the last time you were wrong or you changed your mind I think no. you know and I thought That's that good. was really really cool you know there's not enough there's not enough value in our society uh, in being wrong or like changing your mind like that. What if that was looked at? What if that was something that was socially praised and that was socially like uh, valued, you know, like the way we are about being right. What if it was the other way? And it's like, oh man, do you believe something and then you look further into it. And now you have a different uh philosophy or train of thought like good for you like that's awesome you know like that what if we treated it like that i think that would be a cool paradigm shift you know and maybe a necessary one for people to get comfortable with you know uh, i know as a scientist that's something like i think it became really clear to me early on you know uh, after i got past the 101 classes and stuff and i was like oh like the, when I started to really understand science and the nature of how it changed and how, you know, like new research can kind of upend old understandings, but then how we reproduce data to, to fortify it and, and just all of that, you know, I think it really made me comfortable with like, you know, this is what I know, this is the best I know it, um, but new evidence could still change, change things, you know, and I, I'm okay with it that balance you know uh, and I think that's something that we can impart on to our children and and just the world at large and it might be one way to start changing the tide here but I don't know what do you guys think I just think it's so I think it's so tough people love their social media and so we're not so we're not going to get people off of social media nor do I right. think we Good, because I do think that there's there's a whole lot of benefits. So we focused a whole lot on on the negatives, and there are some substantial benefits to social media. I mean, including you know the spread of like the spread of good information and information that was you know was used to you know basically instigate huge movements towards democracy all through you know Northern Africa and like the Middle East and South America, uh, yeah, South America, everywhere. And mm -hmm. it's just like, so there are, and that's just, you know, the big stuff. There's a lot of like little benefits in being able to interact with people that we normally would not. Um, and finding people who have, you know, these common ideas and these common goals and it helps us make, you know, connections. It helps us find social networks that, you know, we're, we're comfortable in. It's just sometimes, you know, that that goes a, a little bit too far. But so my point is, I don't think that, you know, we can, I don't think that people are going to get rid of social media. 
And I don't think that we can rip down social media. Like, I don't think that we can, you know, rip down and sell the parts of Facebook, you know, because you can, you know, lance that sort of cancer, but another, you know, three things are going to pop up in its place, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. So we have to deal with the situation that we, that we have now. So I would, I'm thinking like the only way that we can make a difference is, at the legislative level level and the right people have to be in office for that to happen so i think that one party currently benefits way more from fake news from manipulation of social media than the other does uh you saw in the you know 2016 russian you know election interference they were trying to put republican candidates into office and um, I generally think that the, the country demographically and politically skews more towards Democrats. So Republicans are generally trying to do whatever it is that they can to, um, to give themselves an advantage in, in elections. So why in the world would they be disposed to, to, um, to, to like turning down a tool that has been very useful for them, frankly. So it's got to happen at the legislative level, but we've got to make the demands and as is as, as a people. And I think that things like Russian interference, election interference, like moves towards like fascism and all of those sorts of things, those are going to be the driving force that give us the collective political will. At least that's that's my hope. And it seems like as Americans or people in general, it's like only when you're on the precipice of something truly terrible can you actually can you actually change. And I don't know if things have gotten so bad yet. But I do believe that the this manipulation of social media is going to become a more mainstream issue, and it can and as it continues to become mainstream, and people are realizing that they're being duped, they are going to there's going to be a whole lot more political will to actually make a make a change. It's so interesting, man. Like as a content creator, you know that's that's what I, I do for Microdose. So like social media is such an integral part of getting the content that I create out there, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I guess one of the things I had to think about is like, you know, it would be so useful for us to create, for people to create content uh, and, and blogs and videos of like this and podcasts that discuss this makes me wonder how much um, visibility they're going to get on these platforms, you know, uh, because like, obviously it's maybe not in the platform's best interest to like promote the spread of these ideas, you know, but these are the ideas that we need getting out there now. And like, it would be really cool from a corporate social responsibility angle. If the people, I think this documentary was a good step, but if the people that are in power, like decided to step up and do something like about this the people that can change things like zuckerberg you know like if they were to make a really conscious effort uh to to do the right thing like and maybe that's a really far-fetched goal you know but yeah. uh, we, <laughs> we, we kind of need that we need that to happen you know yeah i mean um, it, it would be great but i don't i don't think that you can leave it to industry to self-regulate right I mean, historically that always fails and right. uh you know, we were talking about it earlier, Facebook only implemented fact checkers and things of that nature when there was massive outcry from society, mm -hmm. you know, they brought in, they were testified before Congress, right. like, okay, fine, we'll do something about it. You know, of course, Facebook knew about these things, right? right, you know, right. Zuckerberg's up there just essentially lying to Congress. Right. And it's like, you knew about this, you knew this right, was right. going on. And you're right. going to sit here and essentially just lie to Congress. And it's like, we can't, we can't rely on industry to self-regulate. So they they have no financial incentive to do that. The corporation exists to maximize profits. Okay, we understand that. So therefore, these people are going to operate under under this guise of maximizing profits at all costs. Therefore, uh, it's a market failure. They're not going to self-regulate. Society needs to then turn to the legislative branch to create regulatory types of um, laws in order to fix this problem. Um, and another thing too, is that you can go from like a grassroots type of approach where you just inform as many people as possible about this and then how they can push back against it, which is kind of what our platform is a little bit about, right? Uh, so 
I mean, I don't, I don't see, I mean, honestly, Rob, I, I think it's wishful thinking and I hate to say that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. I think, I think the, the grassroots, uh, the grassroots uh, angle is probably the, one of the best ways. And I think if I were to pick one element uh, again about this whole dilemma, uh, the whole social dilemma to, to harp on, it would be to reach out to parents, you know, like think about mothers against drunk driving. Think about yeah. how impactful that is, right? If we reached enough parents, and we're like, this is what this is doing to your kids, you know, <laughs> like whether you realize it or not. Uh, and, and that kind so that, of, that, sorry, that could be uh, like no. trying to explain like how red is a warm color to somebody who's blind, right? Most parents <laughs> didn't grow up with this stuff. So right. like it could yeah. just go over their heads and, you know, sort of, but, not, with not the, be incomprehensible, but like maybe not relatable. Yeah, but with sure. a simple a simple message, I mean, I hate to say this because it's pulling a page out of like every political playbook I hate, but fear is a very good motivator. Like if you have a simple message, like social media is killing your kids, like just a very simple one sentence thing like that, uh, that, is is very effective so i i actually wrote down the stats because i was just blowing away by i think it. i screenshotted them too yeah go ahead yeah the suicide yeah. stats yeah yeah, it's yeah. alarming the suicide among those 10 to 14 has gone up 151 percent since 2010 suicides among those 15 to 19 have gone up 70 percent insane and then self-harm 10 to 14 10 to 14 we're talking kids. that's so yeah. young kids. little kids yeah those are my that's my ne <sighs> those are my nephew's ages it's it's crazy to think that they would you know do something to to harm themselves but that's suicide but self-harm so um not suicide but committing right. you know, doing harm against yourself 15 to 19 year olds it's increased 62 percent in the in the last 10 years or so and among 10 to 14 year olds, it's cre increased 189%. Wow, that's Yeah, the little, the little kids, that, that age group, 10 to 14, seems to be particularly impacted. So like during the, yeah, during like the, the pubescent, the, the developmental stages right there, where they're just kind of learning about, uh, you know, trying to figure out what it means to be an adult. They're maturing. And you know, this is when your your group, like your social group, like you really, really care about what other people think about you. Everyone's insecure because their bodies are changing. Yeah, I mean that group is being particularly impacted. Honestly, from, little kids. No. From from an angle, if, if I was going to create a marketing campaign about mm -hmm. this, and if I was, if that's what I was going to, this is exactly what I would focus on: children, and particularly ten to fourteen years old, and cite those two statistics that are well over a hundred percent increases, and like. I mean, talk about a call to appeal to emotion, you know? I mean, I think that's the most riveting aspect of this whole thing, you know? Um, because you do, we don't let kids smoke pot. Like, we don't let kids drink alcohol. We don't let kids smoke cigarettes. Not at 10 years old, especially. So, like, why is it okay for them to have unrestricted use of something that's clearly so harmful and, and, and reacts with our dopamine systems up in, this, in such a similar way? I think yeah. I think I think if that is brought before a court or brought before Congress or the American people or the world at large, like that would be hard to ignore. Yeah, Profit well, profits or not, you know, one, like one of the things that I had wrote down wrote down when I was watching this because I thought it was interesting is how they would consistently refer to like the social media platforms as a type of drug, right? And I think, at least when I was growing up and in school, the the classical idea of what is a drug is a substance that changes the way your body thinks and feels. I'm thinking that definition may have been updated because it doesn't really seem that good in my opinion. But when you think about like drugs and the body, right? Ultimately, the, bl the brain is electric. We have the electric brain theory, right? So like you can have prosthetics because your brain sends electric signals and, it, and that's what prosthetics use. They can read and respond to electric signals and our body sends electric signals back to our brains so everything is is electric signal when you boil it down right so why why should there be this distinction between like a drug you can ingest or put into your body that 
causes some other organ to send out a signal to your brain versus just a direct feed, you know, from your computer screen to your brain, that is, that's also an electric signal. Like it comes through your eyes and it gets processed, all of that. It's, it's all just electricity. So like to, to, heart, to connect that, um, so there's a device called the NSS2 bridge device, which goes on your ear and it's got three or four electrodes that just clip on your ear or close to your like ear right here. And what it does and has been shown to really efficaciously do is reduce, if not completely eliminate in some people, the symptoms of opiate withdrawal using just electricity. Okay. That's remarkable because we're literally pr producing an effect that drugs produce just using electricity, you know? Uh, so, so what you're saying, I think has such uh, yeah, has a really important relevance here, you know, because because you're right, it's all electricity, and and it, it, they've gotten really good at the science of understanding of how to manipulate that uh, and manipulate us with just what we're seeing on the screen, you know. Another thing that they said in the documentary um, that I found to be particularly salient was at one point they it wasn't it wasn't actually said. I think it was just typed out saying that the only two industries that call their clientele users are is the drug industry and social media <laughs> yeah i i remember that that was so yeah. clever yeah it was very it was, very uh, clever but i mean illegal drugs I and software yeah illegal yeah. illegal drugs and software maybe, illegal maybe drugs that was and software yeah. those are the only two industries where you're a user ah, that's yep. great <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's just so particularly damaging to young psyches to expose them to to these sorts of addictive principles but it's not even just the you know like the addiction so the addiction like gets the gets the social media in the door right so we are constantly you know refreshing our feeds uploading photos seeing how many likes we have we're checking our emails we're you know checking our dms like all those sorts of things right so that's just like sort of like the 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 gatekeeper or whatever right like the real like negative effects like come downstream from that and you know that's when you know you're not getting the likes that you want and your photos are you know getting you know negative comments like that like you were saying earlier grab they have like uh these um kind of reenactments like to, to illustrate the points that they're that they're dealing with in the documentary and one of them uh was that girl that you were talking about who posted a photo she only got two likes and she was pretty you know upset about it so she deleted and posted a new photo likes were coming in and everything like that and she was just very happy and then there was just one comment about her having ears that were too big and then cut to her like in the bathroom and just like looking at her ears to to see you know if they're if they're like too big and like all that sort of stuff but this 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 whole social media like environment has enabled things like cyberbullying and set unrealistic beauty expectations for 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 young women and young men and it's just it's just so damaging when you're so like as, as humans you know we're we're pack creatures we're herd animals so we have to interact with each other and historically we've you know been able to modify and adjust our behavior to fit whatever group that we're in like we learn how to interact on a very limited scale with a limited number of people and that's that's healthy we we realize that you know we've got to participate in, in the groups that we're in but when your group changes from a very small group to tens of thousands of people, you no longer know who to be. You don't know how to please everybody. You're just being pulled in a million different directions. And all of a sudden your identity is lost and you're just trying to become whoever you need to be to satisfy the people out there in you know, cyberspace. And that's just so damaging to, to a young person. And even to, even to us too, I mean, I, I'm not like, I don't have Facebook anymore. I deleted it uh, a couple months back because I realized how damaging and toxic the environment was. But I'd pop on there and check to see how many likes I had on like my most recent article or post or whatever it is. And I would definitely feel like inadequate if nobody had shared it or I had like a like few amount of views. 
and I'm 31 years old. So imagine compounding that and, you know, being, <laughs> being really young and you see some of your other friends being very, you know, quote unquote successful on social media, getting lots of likes and retweets and like all that sort of stuff. And then there you are not being able to measure up. I, I just, that, the feeling of adequacy, inadequacy has just got to be crippling. I, I mean, it's just, it's awful. You know, it's something uh, that you, you mentioned there, Pat, and I think we brought it up a little bit earlier as well, is the idea that, you know, the mind is not equipped to deal with these large volumes of people. There's actually something known as the Dunbar number or the Dunbar limit, which is where, like, your group, you can't really comprehend a group larger than anything around, like, 120 or 130, like your social network. And, like, anything yeah. beyond that, like, you just cannot form connections with people. Um, so this is like something that large organization, organizations grapple with. Like, how do you, how do you motivate people that don't even know each other um, to get them to work with one another? But, you know, another thing too that they talked about in the, uh, in the documentary is the idea that everyone now is like a celebrity. So they're being exposed, you know, to thousands of people on social media. And then of course, all of the things that come with, being exposed to a large number of people, uh, you, you, you get these negative side effects. So for example, you know, your average celebrity, uh, they get chased around by paparazzi and then they get put under a microscope, you know, on social media or, you know, in the, in the tabloids on your, you know, whatever TMZ and like local news stations, things of that nature. But then your average person is having to deal with this as well. And, you know, looking at those statistics from earlier, that 10 to 14 age group, where essentially these people are, I mean, they're not celebrities like Kim Kardashian, where they've got like 30 million Instagram followers or something like that, but you are being put under a lens. Like everyone's putting each other under a lens. There's unreal, unrealistic ideals of what people should look like. Then you have body dysmorphia developing. It's, like, it's not at all surprising that you are seeing a skyrocket in not only suicide, but uh, harm as well that people like self-harm. It's just, yeah. it's just crazy. I mean, the people are just not uh, equipped to deal with this and particularly young developing minds. I mean, Pat, you said, you know, as a, as a 30 year old, like I, I'm the same way. I, I have gotten uh, less over time. Like it doesn't bother me as much because you just kind of get used to it. Like you just understand that this is how social media operates. And if you don't get, you know, an X amount of likes, you don't let it ruin your day. You're like, okay, well, I'm just going to go on creating content because eventually somebody will like it and it's just just the name of the game right you just it's a numbers game just keep putting content out there uh exactly. but for yeah but for young people 10 to 14 it's you know even the average person that doesn't understand these things the average adult it, it's just great it's just crazy i mean we're just not we're not equipped and humans haven't evolved over the past 100 years and we're not evolving at a pace by itself in order to deal with all of this do you oh, yeah, remember don't. that one part of the documentary? I forget what the like term is for it, but there's been a massive influx of young women going into plas plastic surgeons offices yeah. and saying, I want to look like the filters on, on Instagram. I, I forget yeah. what it's called, but it's like, could you imagine like being like to, to that level and like need that level of, of validation and be set to that standard of beauty. Like a picture is not just a picture anymore. You've got to filter it and add, you know, everything else to try to try and make yourself to try and make yourself, you know, look better, like different from who you are. And it's just like that sets, you know, even the expectation that like, this is how I, I should look. This is how I want to look. And uh, that, that, that was just really, you know, sort of enlightening and crazy to me that, uh, that that was, that it was happening enough that they had like a psychological term for it and everything yeah. like that. Um, yeah, it's alarming. And it's definitely, you know, we were talking about this, there are some good aspects, absolutely good aspects to social media, but like the negatives are just getting worse and worse and society needs to grapple with it. Uh, I mean, on that note, I guess we could, talk about, you know, what exactly can people do? You know, there's some things mentioned in Social, social Dilemma uh, towards the end of the doc documentary, documentary where they were like, okay, well, this is what people should do in order to minimize the harm that you can, that social media can incur to like your children or to even yourself. Uh, you know, we were talking about earlier about how you know, developing 
better critical thinking skill set, uh, you know, learning more about how science operates in order to combat the the onslaught of false information that you will come across. But even you know things such as making sure that your notifications are turned off for all of your social media, you know, maybe even getting off of social media altogether. You know, for some of us that create content regularly, you can't do that, or perhaps you know people really um, you know, feel a strong need to stay connected through through social media with friends and family, which is fine. I understand that. Again, you know, going back to your point, Pat, where humans, being being that we are pack animals, we are gregarious. We need to connect with people. So I totally get that. Uh, but what can you know? I guess what are what are some of the other ideas? I don't recall all of them. I know them's like you know notifications, you know, turning off all of the notifications, uh, maybe even deleting apps. I think it's maybe charge age. your phone, charge yeah. your phone in like a separate room, you know, like don't check Facebook the first thing you do when you open your eyes in the morning, you know, <laughs> like I know with people that, uh, and with, with vaping, it's become an interesting thing. And here's an interesting parallel uh, because of the accessibility, like you can vape anywhere. You don't have to like go outside to smoke a cigarette. Um, and like people will reach, you know, this case, again, it's happening a lot in the younger generation. They become really addicted to their jewel pods, you know, to where it's like before they even open their eyes in the morning, they're already hitting their jewel pods. We're, we're really like that with our phones, you know. It's yeah. like I understand if you use it as an alarm, but you can buy an alarm clock. You know, those things still exist and, and, uh, and, and you don't need to get have, look at your phone first thing in the morning and then look at all the notifications and then immediately in that, if you want to think of the morning time as like a mini birth almost in the sense that like, I, I don't know if there's really solid data to, to support this, but I feel like you might feel more neuroplastic in that time when you first wake up in the morning. You know, a lot of people, a lot of creative people, a lot of dignitaries that will be like, the mornings are time to like get the creative work done and like really uh, be productive or whatever. So I think you're really throwing a wrench in your day when you're starting it off immediately. It's like, well, what comments did I get? How many likes did I get? What headlines are there, you know? And like, it's the first thing you're inundating yourself with. Uh, and then like just some people, they don't even go to the bathroom, you know, without being able to like be on their phone. And, and so I think part of it is that habitual like deprogramming or reprogramming, you know, with the way it fits into our lives. And the thing is, like, we can't expect our children and the kids to do it if we don't start setting the example, you know. And, and I think there are different, when it comes to a solution, there are different things. We're talking about bad information and fake news and stuff. I think that's more pertinent to us and adults, you know, uh, than it is the kids who aren't voting and things like that. So, like, with the children, I definitely think... I don't know. I don't know how. If it's just a way that they're just not allowed to use the app, if there's like a safe version of the app for the kids, or like a limited version, or if they're just not shouldn't ha have cell phones with all that capability, and they should just have a, a regular phone until they're 15, or get past that really critical age range where the suicides and health harm is going up. Um, these are just some of the things I'm playing with in my mind as possible solutions. But there's different tiers of regulation and stuff with with it being necessary. To be the most restrictive for that age group, the younger age group, you know, and then, you know, I guess we're already trying to see things like flagging false news and stuff for uh, the older generation, you know, or, or older people. Um, this is just me assuming there's not like fake news that is really impacting the younger generation. I think it's two separate things, you know. Um, but yeah, these are some things I'm playing with, but it's just going to take a very sophisticated and evidence-based approach to, to figuring out the solution to this because like Pat said look the genie is out of the bottle there's no way to undo this now you know there's no way to take this out of our lives uh completely so um, I don't know I think that I view it as like uh maybe like three tiered approach like there's the individual level approach so what you and I do every day you know and I think that you know Garab made like a lot of great points but I think just generally trying to like limit our screen time is probably, you know, a good thing to be doing. And then also for, you know, that, that's got to translate to like work too, because I know that I'm basically available all day for work. I check like I my emails and everything. So I feel like we need to like set that aside and be like, you know, after five, you know, I'm home. And then I think that, you know, there's got to be some onus on the parents to, limit their children's screen time, like maybe give, you know, them some education, but also, you know, evaluating the news sources that we get and, you know, being able to critically think. 
And uh, then there's the sort of, you know, grassroots push, you know, like what we're doing at IS, trying to inform people, trying to give people the tools that they need to help themselves at the individual level. And then there's like the legislative level where, you know, not much is happening, but, you know, we could hopefully influence them from our individual and collective levels to, you know, be taking some action. So, yeah, I just think that you've got to address it, you know, at all three tiers if you ultimately want to be successful. And uh, even then, I don't even know what the barometer for success is. It's like, how do we say we've won? You know, it, it, it seems like it's just an ongoing, ever-changing battle because, I mean, yeah, not only are things not going away, but things are still advancing at lightning, not at warp pace. Like we are still advancing. Algorithms are becoming more sophisticated. We're being targeted with greater degrees of accuracy. We're being fed news and articles and videos at it, you know, rates it with with more specificity than we ever have before. So we really need to, you know, be taking action, like I said, at like all three of those of those levels. And I don't know what success looks like, but maybe, you know, small incremental change is, is the way to be and avoiding generally devastating consequences like uh, the 2016 election interference or the situation that they detailed in the documentary, which was in uh, Myanmar, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the government basically controls the internet, controls Facebook, and they used Facebook as a way to basically set up propaganda against Muslims in the country that led to a massive uprising and genocide amongst that population. Yeah, that, so, was ter that was terrible. <laughs> terrible, horrifying. Yeah, yeah but, just terrible. But that's just like, I mean, so we've seen genocides even in recent, you know, years. I mean, in Rwanda and then uh, in uh, the former Yugoslavia. And it's just like the speed at which misinformation and propaganda can be spread and these like genocides and these mass killings can, you know, be initiated has has grown exponentially and it's becoming more and more alarming and it's just you know that that's one of the things that we definitely have to be afraid of here in the united states because we're seeing it we're seeing it already we're seeing people being driven to violence we're you know we're we're not we're seeing a lot of these effects like on maybe a little bit of a smaller scale but uh it definitely could you know lead to some longer term more devastating consequences you know, I agree with uh, your sort of tiered descriptions on the individual and the legislative. I think when you have companies that are essentially toying with our psychology and using our own psychology against us, there's a certain degree to which you can't expect the individual to, you know, overcome their own brain. And we we did that with like subliminal messaging right so like you can't you know flash images at people rapidly to induce this psychological state of like i think they used to do it with like coca-cola or something at movies where you would like produce this desire to go and like buy a coke from a subliminal message and we were like yeah you can't manipulate people's psychology that way they can't you know people can't defend against that you're you're essentially tapping into our brains in ways that we don't even know about so the legislative level is going to be, I think, necessary in putting those types of blocks in because otherwise, like, we're not going to be able to do it ourselves. And to some extent, like, I know that people, so there's going to be people out there that watch this and they're like, well, if there's a problem with social media, just don't use it. And I think that is totally <coughs> bypassing the, like, the psychology of the matter and, like, the addictive nature of it. And, um, yeah, so, like, the legislative area is going to be necessary to overcome that. From the individual area, all of the sort of individual suggestions that they gave and that we've talked about, they all have this one thing in common, which is you have to put up essentially a roadblock between you and access. So um, I've seen this like everywhere in terms of like, how do you manage money better, right? How do you stop yourself from going and spending money that you don't really want to spend and what you know the experts will say is 
put your money in more than one spot so that you don't have easy access to it. If you can block off your easy access to something, you are less likely to access it. And I think that's a very like basic fundamental psychological like human piece of nature of when you when you install like roadblocks between you and what you want, it deters you to some extent. So like turning off your notifications, that's one way to sort of do that. But I think all like probably the best way is to just sign out. If you have to if you have to put in your username and password every single time you want to get on, it's gonna be annoying. And that's sort of the point. So like <laughs> I think a lot of people would be at least somewhat deterred and like get off the social media a little bit longer if they actually had to jump through a little bit of hoop to get onto it. Which I think on the legislative level, if they passed a bill and they were like, yeah, you can't, social media cannot auto save your credentials in. Like that would probably be like one of the easiest things that they could do to reduce. I think it would probably have a fairly drastic effect in reducing it, but I think, you know, there might be more needed, but that would be easy. That would be like one step that is just super easy that we could do um, to just put a, a, a hoop to jump through for people to roadblock them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think it like speaks to like habit formation, like how do you break a bad habit type mm -hmm. of deal? And there's various ways that you can do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you are, I guess, um, I mean, m maybe the addiction component of it, maybe it moves beyond habit. like not being able to break a bad habit. I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that at least in my case, in order to get me to stop using social media as much, uh, what I did was I turned off notifications. And that way I'm not interacting with them as much. I'm not getting pinged. And that helped me to break that habit. You know, another thing too, is that I think there are actually other apps that you can download that will block your social media apps. Like if you insist on having them, like you throw them essentially into a virtual lockbox so you can't use them during certain hours of the day. Um, and then you can only use them during certain times and that again will help you to break that habit. Uh, so I think, you know, speaking to what you were talking about, like putting up roadblocks, that this really, that these extra roadblocks, these extra steps help to break bad habits. Uh, I mean, another example, this isn't related to social media, but my car insurance of all things. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that is illegal and that they really don't want you to do is to use your phone while you're driving, right? They don't want you to look at it. They don't want you to do text or anything. So I have, um, my car insurance has an app that I can download and it tracks my, my screen time whenever I'm driving, like so it's GPS located. And whenever I'm using the phone, it keeps track of that while I'm driving. And it, I have a running score throughout the month. And if I'm over a certain percentage, I get a bonus. And I think that's like a really, really good incentive in order to uh, make sure that I'm not using my phone while I'm driving. It's like an extra roadblock in the way of using my phone while, I, while I'm driving. Because I know that app is there and then I'm gonna get penalized for doing it. And it, it hurts them, I guess, in a sense. So it's an, that roadblock that you're talking about, uh, Garrett. So, uh, you know, for people that, you know, have an issue with social media, there are ways that you can put the roadblocks in there uh, and, you know, getting rid of the notifications and like maybe using one of these lockbox lock box apps um, is, is, a, is a solution as well. Uh, and then going back real quickly to Pat, what you, were, what you were talking about earlier, the how would we know that we're making progress because it's a, it's a dynamical landscape with all of social media I think that we would know by looking at the same metrics that we know that it's bad. <laughs> so the suicide rates, uh, looking at other important metrics like polarization, uh, things of that, if you can even quantify these things, right? But there are things, there are, there are metrics that we use to determine that these are, that this is an issue in the first place. So I'm thinking that, you know, if these metrics are going up, that if we can see a reversal in this trend, that means that we would hopefully be on the right track. And I'm not saying that other yeah. countries wouldn't pop up in the meantime, but I, I think a reversal of the current trend with the currently the current metrics that we're using to determine that it's an issue in the first place uh, right. would be like looking for that inflection point. I think that would, then we could say, hey, we finally have a grasp on this. 
Um, so like it might not be as simple as restricting social media use yeah. in the intended 14 year olds for that number to, you know what, I take that back. I think, I think there would be a noticeable because of how crazy high that number is and how yeah. fast it's increasing. I think if, I think that would be a great indicator of success. Actually, it's like the, the suicide rate and self harm rate in 10 to 14 year olds is going down. We're doing something right. We should keep going down this path. We should find what that is, and then we should pursue that farther. And 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 that I just for me that's the most compelling statistic or group of statistics of all of this entire thing, you know, uh, because like those are the ones that are most severely affected, that they're hurting themselves or they're killing themselves. But like and and that number is spiking at such a crazy rate, right? But think about the, the gradient, right? Think about all the people that aren't falling under that statistic, but are still really emotionally distraught by that, you know, and still really hurt by that. Those people are then growing up and they're our future, man. <laughs> Those are the people yeah. that are, are going to be the next doctors and lawyers and scientists and, and, and parents, you know, and everything. And so it, it really has uh, a huge impact on our society and humanity as a whole. Uh, and it's super important and we can't just, we can't have the people in power that are, are profiting off of this. Look at this in a short term lens. It's, it's way too dangerous. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you're making, you're, you're screwing over generations, you know? And so definitely like that, that, that would be one of the statistics I would look out for uh, the most would be like, how is this affecting our children and our, our less kids freaking killing themselves, you know? Uh, and, and then, and then I, I think when it comes to the other tiers and it comes to like fake information, false news, things of that nature, you know, um, we have a long way to go as of yet. But uh, I think the most pressing part of all of this, in my personal opinion, at least, is definitely the children. You know, people say, you know, is that funny? There's a hashtag, save the kids, or uh, save the children, and it was all had to have to do with like, um, you know, like human trafficking and stuff like yeah. that. Uh, which is important re- <laughs> which is very important yeah. of yes. course but really that that should be applied the, the the gusto and the popularity that that hashtag had to do with human trafficking like it, it should be applied to this because it's like this is like the silent killer in a lot of ways you know it's like you don't even realize that what it's doing uh you know and so people i feel like people the the opportunity here is i think a lot of humans will feel the same way when they realize how this is affecting our youth. It's, it's a natural response. Like, oh crap, like this is happening to our kids. We want it. we should do something about this. I think we should ride that way and, and we should pursue this, you know, um, down that line and maybe let all the changes to social media start from there. You know, if that's the most gut-wrenching, compelling thing about it, right? The problem with it right now, let's start there. Start there and start making changes because through that, we'll realize that this is not just affecting our youth, it's affecting all of us. They're just the most vulnerable and the most susceptible of the human population, you know, and that's why we're seeing these really uh, dark and really drastic effects in, in, in children. But like, understand that they're still human and, and those same operations and processes that are playing on their minds are playing on all of ours, you know. Um, so that's just my two cents on like how we should go about our, our revolution because a revolution is really needed. This is a really big power and force that we're trying to go up against, but it couldn't be more necessary, you know, for us to do it and do it now. I think no, that I've... they should. I think that <clears throat> the next administration should um, appoint an independent, like, independent commission to research these effects and not only research the effects that, you know, we, we currently have, but also, you know, set, set potential, you know, legislative solutions and also establish these various barometers for success. So we can do like, uh, we can do like status updates, but get together, you know, people who are working in the tech industry, get together scientists, psychologists, um, physiologists, like uh, get all, get together all these people, get this commission to provide recommendations and rely on the word of, of scientists, I feel like would be, you know, just effective way to, you know, do it, you know, for as the usual. upstream. 
Yeah. As usual, that would be good advice for us to follow. <laughs> yeah. For society yeah. in general, yeah. Let's listen yeah. to the evidence people. <laughs> listen to what scientists have to say. Yeah, and um, you know, building upon your point, Gaurav, that you made earlier, uh, just real quick here, uh, it's not just a problem for the kids. I think that that is the most salient thing, but when you have one of the previous executives who helped build all of this, telling us that he is most concerned in the immediate future about civil war. Right. I mean, that is, that is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and that's absolutely terrifying. And you can very easily see that if you go onto Facebook. Uh, sometimes you can, when people just, they, they don't know how to talk to each other. Uh, again, you can't, you can't agree on what's real anymore. How did we come to a point where we don't even know where, what facts are and what truth is? Yeah, like it's you know, just, the whole I, flat earth thing, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but you know that famous yeah. basketball player or something that he, he yeah. came out and said, oh, I'm sorry, I saw a, a link that I saw a, a story that said the earth was flat and I didn't even really read it. <laughs> and I thought it was true. And like, okay, but, but you're a famous basketball player, man. When you retweeted that shit, a lot of people got behind you. And that was a, that, you know, it's kind of funny, but, but that's a really stark example of like, man, we, Galileo was was almost hung for for trying to <laughs> say the Earth wasn't in the center of the universe. And we've come a long way for us to all of a sudden take a big leap backwards because of social media and because someone said something. But, but that's just the nature, you know, of where we're at today. Like years and years, centuries of hard scientific facts and understanding can just be upended in someone's mind because of something they see on. Facebook and like yeah. that's a real threat to science and evidence and information and society you know yeah that's like, a, a that's, that's a threat to <laughs> the social fabric of that holds everything together I mean I don't yeah I mean how do you again I mean I, I don't know how you would function in a society where you don't even know what's real anymore I mean and that's <laughs> yeah. what it feels like sometimes again when people are put in these echo chambers and as Garrett was saying earlier with the facts being so disconnected that essentially you are making up a new reality <clears throat> with all of these okay you, you've got facts but again you can't connect any of them or maybe you're not even getting facts maybe what you think are getting are facts and what you're really getting is fake news and other distorted right. types of media uh, propaganda things of that nature but but you believe it uh, I mean I try to have cross the aisle conversations in politics all the time and I cannot mm -hmm. tell you how unbelievably aggravating it is when I can't even agree on what reality is with people. Yeah. And then I get attacked and get called names because right. I'm like, no, this is what the truth is. You know, here's, here's the links to the evidence, et cetera. You know, what are your sources? You'd be surprised about how many people don't even care about where their information comes from and they won't provide sources for you to analyze. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just very alarming. So, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. The, I mean, the 10 to 14, that is awful, uh, and we need to do something about it. I'm even equ I'm equally concerned about the Civil War prognostication by that one executive. <laughs> right, right, right. From the Social yeah. Dilemma no, I, I overlooked that. You're right. That, yeah, that's no, I, I think just as pressing. Like, <laughs> yeah, we need to, like all, like, all aspects of society, regardless of age group, needs to have some sort of social media intervention where we just become better consumers of information or like we learn how to detach from it, something of that nature, because it is, it is wreaking havoc on all levels of human existence, in my opinion, um, like adults, children, and it's completely unregulated right now. And I initially, when it was first brought to my attention, like six, I don't know, six, nine months ago, something of that nature about, you know, regulating social media, I didn't fully appreciate how bad the problem was at that time right and you know looking at how everything has transpired between then and now i think it was initially when uh facebook in particular was brought before it to the congressional hearings for like three days of like grilling by congress with zuckerberg and i was like okay well they he got grilled and we'll see how they respond and i have not seen the level of response needed i mean there have been fact checkers that we, we discussed previously but i it's just not enough. It's just not enough. And I, you know, I'm a proponent of regulation now, whereas before I was interested in seeing how the market would self-regulate. And I know that's a foolish position, but I always, I guess, tend to give people the benefit of the doubt to see if they can actually self-correct. Like, do you have any integrity? Like, I'd like to see some. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, capitalism doesn't allow for it when you 
push when you're publicly traded and you're, you're uh, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility to, uh, to maximize profits. It just doesn't allow it. And these people operate under this and they're like, okay, well, it's fine because I'm doing exactly what the marketplace demands and this is what you're supposed to do in a capitalistic, capitalistic society and morals and values be damned type of deal. So that's not my problem. My, my problem is to maximize profits. And then if society wants to do something about it, then they're going to have to figure something else out. I'm not going to take any responsibility. Yeah, that's pretty grim, um, but true. No, it, it is. I mean, they've taken, they've taken some responsibility, right? I mean, we can right. admit that with the fact checkers and things of that nature. Right. And you saw that Twitter stepped in and they took a lot of heat because they removed one of the president's tweets that contained false information. But it's not enough. It's just, it's just not. And I, I'm not... I'm not convinced of it. Uh, I'm even more convinced that they need regulation, even since they went towards um, before Congress and testified that they would do something about it. Um, I just I'm not I'm not seeing what I want to see, and I, I think society deserves better. Uh, so, social dilemma really highlights how badly it's needed, how badly change is needed. Yeah, what a Agreed. well done uh, for someone. You know, I'm working on this documentary now for for Microdose, and it's just the social dilemma had a really powerful impact on me. Like, what an amazing commentary and way to hopefully spark some change and spark conversations like this and a movement to to, <clears throat> to help change things, you know, and to really open our eyes. I really commend them for the job they did, the courage those people had to speak out. Uh, they were nervous. Okay, think about that for yeah. a second. We're in the United States. It's not like they're in Iran or something and they're getting up to speak the truth to power, you know? We're in the United States and those people were, were visibly shaken and were worried about the implications of what they were about to say, but they still went up there and they said those things because they felt so uh, strongly about it. And that says something to all of us, you know? Like if they were that willing to get up there, with the experience and knowledge and know-how they have, but how these tools work and affect the, the human brain and society at large, there's something there, <laughs> something really important there that they're trying to get across. And I think it's high time that we listen. No, absolutely. Well, guys, uh, anything else that you wanted to mention? I think this is a good place to wrap things up. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, all right. Okay, perfect. So for those of you that are tuning in, thank you so much. As always, it, uh, it was just great to be able to have a platform where all of us can discuss these ideas. And we really hope that uh, you enjoyed today's, uh, today's session talking about the social dilemma. Uh, if you're listening to us, make, a, make sure to check us out on YouTube, subscribe, like. We always appreciate the feedback as well. Uh, so take care. Until next time, guys, thanks so much for joining. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. All right. All right, take care. Yeah, Bye. thanks, everybody. Bye.